the Chicago River is flowing backward. Rather than going downhill from inland Illinois into Lake Michigan, instead it goes that way, in the opposite direction. This isn't some quirk of nature, but an engineering mega project. Indeed, four engineering mega projects on a scale quite unlike anything else on Earth. So, what does it take to reverse a river? To find out why you might want to do this, we need to go back to 1850 Chicago. Over the preceding two decades, the city had grown from a tiny outpost of 100 souls into a thriving industrial center of 100,000. Nestled between the banks of Lake Michigan and the Chicago River, it formed the central node of a sprawling North American trade network. Unfortunately, it was also a very flat, effectively lake-level swamp, where stagnant pools of human waste formed the perfect breeding ground for pathogens. In 1845, an outbreak of cholera had killed some 6% of the city's population. In 1855, the Chicago Board of Sewage Commissioners brought in Boston engineer Ellis S. Chesborough to construct what would become America's first sewer system. The idea was to lay some pipe, feed it into the river, and have the river take all of our human waste out into the lake. In order for pipe to work, it needs to be installed at a bit of an angle, so that gravity can bring all that sewage downhill. However, since the streets were already effectively at river level, this meant that the new pipe would need to be laid up to 4 meters above the existing street. That was okay, we did that, put in some soil, and called it a day, effectively redefining street level for the entire city. Apparently, the city's buildings didn't quite get the memo, and soon found their ground floors several meters beneath the new street. This didn't just make egress really inconvenient, but also provided a new home for those stagnant pools which we were trying to get rid of in the first place. In 1858, engineers James Brown and James Hollingsworth rose to the challenge. Employing a team of 50 workers and using 200 jack screws, they were able to lift a 700-ton building some two meters back to the level of the new street. The pair raised another 50 buildings that year, and soon engineers from all over the country were in Chicago competing to see who could lift the most spectacular structures. While some used hydraulics brought in from California, most instead preferred to use manual labor and an insane amount of jack screws. These combined the mechanical advantages of a twisting inclined plane with the extra torque you get from using a super long rod. Incredibly, Chicago's bustling city center was able to continue on with business as usual, with one guest at the Tremont House Hotel writing in bafflement that the steps onto the street seemed to be becoming steeper and steeper with every passing day for no apparent reason. I think this first Chicago mega project would perhaps be better well known if it wasn't for the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, which incinerated the city and erased everyone's hard work. Another problem had also started to become evident. As the city, its population, and its industries grew, so too did the level of pollution in the Chicago River. When it wasn't spontaneously catching fire, you could walk across it on floating rafts of sludge. All that muck eventually made its way out into the lake, the same place where people were getting their apparently clean drinking water. Cholera deaths and illness continued pretty much unabated. In 1863, Chesra then proposed a second Chicago mega project, digging the world's biggest, longest, deepest underwater tunnel, for which to collect water from some three kilometers out in the lake and bring it into the city for people to drink. Using the tunnel shield technique discussed in our Boston episode, during the day, diggers would remove the required material, and at night, bricklayers added in the required supports. Working from opposite ends, it took them two years, but eventually they met in the middle, celebrated for a while, and then got right back to work, this time digging a six kilometer long tunnel. As it turns out, the initial water collection crib was still too close to the polluting waters of the river, and people were still getting sick. Eventually, nine of these collection cribs were constructed, of which two are still in use today. However, putting them further and further and out was only ever going to be a temporary solution. Something serious would need to be done. Obviously a little bit upset, 
Chesborough then proposed his third and most insane mega project yet. If the problem was with the river taking its pollution out into the lake, then why don't we take the river and its pollution somewhere else? Ideally into the Mississippi, where it would then empty out into the Gulf of Mexico. This would have an extra benefit of connecting the city to yet more trade routes. Unfortunately, there was a slight problem. The subcontinental divide was in the way. Although construction delays brought about by a civil war meant that Chesborough never got to see his project underway, eventually the work of explosives, steam shovels and thousands of labourers took to the task of removing the cried 33 million cubic metres of soil and rock. This provided an excellent training ground for the engineers who eventually went on to build the Panama Canal. They had indeed constructed a 45 kilometre long canal right through the divide, downward sloping in order to allow the water to flow through. When it was completed in 1900, the reverse Chicago River contained a substance which actually resembled water. That isn't to say though the project was entirely without its downside. Where the waters empty out into the Gulf of Mexico, they form state-sized algal blooms which have been devastating to marine life. Although a fourth Chicago mega project, the construction of the world's largest wastewater treatment plant has improved water quality somewhat, it still hasn't been enough in order to remove the bloom inducing levels of phosphorus mineral. Where the waters pass through farmland, they have inundated the soil, which has really damaged crop yields. Although you might expect that all these downsides are limited to downstream, as it turns out, this new water course has provided an unexpected backdoor for invasive species such as carp. For the moment, these are kept at bay with a bubble curtain and electrified fence near the town of Joliet. But if they were to ever break through, this could put the Great Lakes $7 billion a year fishing industry in jeopardy. Despite these drawbacks, Chicago's four mega projects are a triumph and wonder of engineering. They turned a cholera infested swamp into a river that occasionally caught fire into a backward flowing water body, and finally into the semi-pristine waters at the heart of one of America's most important cities. As for what's next for Chicago, I've got no idea, but I'm sure that it'll be suitably mega. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.